Well, hello, brothers and sisters in Christ of Redeemer Reformation Church, and uh, welcome to all who are visiting our YouTube channel today. Uh, blessed Lord's Day to you all, and I pray that you'll be blessed now as we meditate on God's Word. I, and I invite you to turn with me in the Bible to Hebrews chapter 1. I'll read from Hebrews chapter 1 uh, now, and uh, we'll read the whole chapter. So let's give attention now to God's holy, inerrant, and inspired Word. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature, and He upholds the universe by the word of His power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you? Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship Him. Of the angels, He says, He makes His angels winds and His ministers a flame of fire. But of the Son, He says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of Your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore God, Your God, has anointed You with the oil of gladness beyond Your companions." And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? Well, this far, the reading of God's holy word, may he bless it to our hearts this Lord's Day. And I invite you to also uh, turn with me in the Hadaber Catechism now uh, to our Lord's Day lesson, which can be found in the Catechism in Lord's Day 13, uh, Lord's Day 13, which is page 214 in the Forms and Prayers book, uh, if you're using that, page 214, uh, or page 877 in the Songbook, page 877 in the Songbook. But let's listen now uh, carefully to what we believe and confess as a church based on God's Word from Lord's Day 13. Why is He called God's only begotten Son when we also are God's children? Because Christ alone is the eternal, natural Son of God. We, however, are adopted children of God, adopted by grace for the sake of Christ. Why do you call Him our Lord? Because not with gold or silver, but with His precious blood, He has delivered and purchased us, body and soul, from sin and from the tyranny of the devil, to be His very own. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, we continue our series within a series of the Apostles' Creed, as our catechism is at this point going through the various articles of the Apostles' Creed, and we're in the middle section of the Apostles' Creed, um, where we confess God the Son and our redemption. And uh, we've been carefully considering uh, the person of Christ, who He is, uh, before uh, we pretty soon are going to, I think next Sunday actually, we're going to get into the work of Christ. But you cannot separate the person and work of Christ, but it's important to first consider who our Lord and Savior is, Jesus Christ. And we've seen that He is called Jesus because He saves His people from their sins. And we've seen that He is called the Christ um, because He is the Anointed One and He has been 
ordained by God the Father and uh, equipped by the Holy Spirit, anointed by the Holy Spirit to be our chief prophet and teacher, uh, our only high priest, and our eternal king. He is our mediator who saves us. Um, He is the Lord of the covenant, and He is the servant mediator of the covenant. And now we come to uh, what it means to confess in the creed that I believe in God's, uh, that He is God's only begotten Son, our Lord. And uh, we'll consider then from our Lord's Day lesson today, from God's Word, um, how Jesus is uniquely God's Son, and then secondly, how we become God's Son, and then thirdly, how Jesus is the greatest Lord. So how Jesus is uniquely God's Son, how we become God's sons, and how Jesus is the greatest Lord as well. And so first, consider with me how Jesus is uniquely God's Son. Uh, The themes of this Lord's Day lesson are drawn out of many Scripture passages, um, but Hebrews 1 really captures it quite well. Uh, Notice how Hebrews 1 begins again, long ago at many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, in other words, these last days are the time between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. And in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. And He upholds the universe by the word of His power. After making purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. What a wonderful intro uh, to the book of Hebrews. And uh, notice just in these opening verses of Hebrews 1 that we see here again this threefold office of Jesus Christ as our prophet, priest, and king. We saw that last Sunday especially, but we see it here again. Uh, we see in these verses that Jesus is the fullest revelation of God. Uh, in verse 3, he says he is the radiance of God and the exact imprint of his nature. In other words, he's our, he's our chief prophet. God has spoken to us in these last days in Jesus' words and deeds. If you want to know God's will for your life and what you're to believe uh, concerning salvation, uh, you need to look to Jesus Christ as the ultimate revelation of God's will for your life and what you should believe concerning salvation. Um, Not only is He our chief prophet we see here again, but He's our only high priest. It says in verse 3, Jesus made purification for our sins. After having made purification for our sins, then He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And there again, now we see His office of King. Uh, He's our eternal King uh, who has been enthroned at the Father's right hand on high. And so, as our promised Messiah, the Christ, He is our prophet, priest, and king. And notice that the author of Hebrews goes on to say that He is superior to angels in verse 5. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when He brings the firstborn into the world, He says, Let all God's angels worship Him. Uh, Children, perhaps you think that angels are pretty amazing creatures, and uh, we hear a lot about angels uh, at Christmas time, uh, announcing the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. We hear a lot about angels at Easter time, announcing the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, they are amazing creatures of God, but they aren't as amazing as Jesus, our Lord and Savior. God's Word says that Jesus is far more superior than angels and glorious than angels. He is above them. He created them. He is the Creator. All things were created through Jesus, the Son of God. And so the angels themselves, as glorious as they are, worship Jesus and serve Him, children. And we are never to worship angels because they are but creatures We are only to worship the one true God, the Creator of the heavens and the earth, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
uh, one in essence and three in persons. And Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. And He's superior to the angels. And Jesus is our only mediator, not angels. It is through Jesus that we have a personal relationship with God. And so we ought not to uh, use angels as our mediator in any way to have access to God. We have access to the Father through the Son, Jesus Christ. And Hebrews mentions in verse 5 that Jesus is begotten. He's the begotten Son. This starts to get us into this question, how Jesus is uniquely God's Son. He says in verse 5, for to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my Son, today I have begotten you. Uh, Now you may be thinking, what does the author of Hebrews mean when he says of Jesus, today I have begotten you? Uh, It almost sounds like at first glance that the author of Hebrews is saying that on a certain day, Jesus was begotten and came into existence, that, um, that the Son of God never existed before uh, the incarnation. Uh, for example, when a, when a human father begets a son, that son comes into existence. That's what we say about human begetting. Um, when, uh, you know, my son didn't exist um, before Uh, January 16, 2009, my firstborn son didn't exist before that date, but on January 16th, 2009, I begot a son uh, with the help of my wife, of course, and uh, some doctors and nurses, and uh, ultimately God's grace. And uh, and so it, it sounds like the author of Hebrews is saying that on a certain day that the Son of God came into existence and became God's son. And Actually, in one sense, this is what he means, but we have to be careful here. Uh, We know from other scriptures that there never was a time that Jesus, who is the Son of God, didn't exist, because Jesus is the eternal Son of God. He is the eternal Son of God. So, what does Hebrews 1 verse 5 mean then? Well, we need to understand that Jesus is the Son of God in two senses in the Bible. Uh, In the first place, Jesus is the eternal Son of God according to His divine nature. And in the second place, He is the historical, messianic Son of God according to His human nature. In the first sense, Jesus, the Son of God, is eternally begotten of God the Father. In the Nicene Creed, which we confessed earlier in our liturgy, we confess, I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all ages, God of God, light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father." Now, these are carefully crafted words based on the Scriptures. Uh, He is eternally begotten of the Father, but there never was a time that the Son of God did not exist. There's never been a time where the Father did not have His Son and the Son did not have the Father. Uh, Jesus Christ is the eternally begotten Son of God. And He's not made. He's begotten eternally, but not made, as the creed says. And we we see that in Hebrews 1, right? He is God. He is the one through whom everything else has been made and created. So He lands on the Creator side of the Creator-creature distinction. And, uh, And He is, as the creed says, of one substance with the Father, or as the author of Hebrews puts it, he uh, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Uh, And so, uh, there never was a time that the Son of God did not exist. Jesus is the eternal Son of God, and he he is unique in that way. He is the only eternal Son of God, uh, or or, or the only begotten uh, Son of God, and there never was a time that he did not exist. He is God the Son. And uh, no other child of God can say that. And so our catechism asks, you know, if He's 
called God, the only begotten Son of God, um, how come we're also called children of God? And, and we're, we're acknowledging here that, that He is unique in His Sonship. We are sons through adoption. We are children of God through adoption, as we'll come to in a little bit. Um, but here we acknowledge that no other child of God can, can say these things that we're saying here, that the Son, Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. Um, my own son and sons, you know, might bear a, a resemblance to me as their father, and uh, hopefully the better parts, uh, but uh, we wouldn't say that uh, my son is the exact imprint of my nature. In other words, we both have a human nature, but it's not the exact same human nature. On the other hand, Jesus has the exact same divine nature as God the Father and God the Spirit. They are one in nature and three in persons. And this is what we are getting at when we confess that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God, or as our catechism puts it, the only natural Son of God. We're getting at the uniqueness of Jesus as the divine, eternal Son of God. He is eternally begotten of the Father. And uh, if you want to explore that doctrine of the eternal generation of the Son more fully, I just encourage you to go back to our sermon on the doctrine of the Trinity uh, or to some of our uh, sermons from the Athanasian Creed, uh, based on the Athanasian Creed as we heard uh, back in, uh, I think it was November of 2020. Uh, but as I, as I said, Jesus is the Son of God in two senses in the Bible, right? He's in the first sense the eternal Son of God according to His divine nature, but then, secondly, He is the historical messianic Son of God according to His human nature. And this also expresses His uniqueness as the Son of God. He is the historical messianic Son of God according to His human nature. And this brings us back to our statement in Hebrews 1, verse 5, You are My Son, today I have begotten you. Uh, this is, in fact, a quote from Psalm 2, where God says these same words, to his anointed king in Israel on earth. Uh, it was actually a common feature in ancient Near Eastern culture for the king of a nation to be referred to as the Son of God. Now, the pagan nations obviously had no real God because they served false gods. They served counterfeit gods. Uh, but Israel did serve the one true God. And in the Old Testament, God refers to the king of Israel as His Son. Uh, we see this in the next uh, quote in Hebrews 1 verse 5 as well, where He says, or again, I will be to Him, that is the King of Israel, I will be to Him a Father, and He shall be to me a Son. Now, where is this quote, quote from? There's tons of Old Testament quotes in this opening chapter, right? Where's this one from? I will be to Him a Father, and He shall be to me a Son. Well, this is found in 2 Samuel 7, a very important chapter in the Bible that you should know well because that is where God establishes the Davidic covenant with David. And there we read, in, in, if you were to go back and look at that, and you can, you can go there right now if you want while I'm describing it, and, um, but there we read how David wants to build God a house. Uh, he looks at his own house and of cedar, which was no doubt a sight to behold, and, and, uh, and he sort of feels bad for God. You know, I've got this wonderful mansion as the king, I've got this beautiful home, uh, but what about God? He doesn't have a, he doesn't have a house as glorious as this, and he, he looks at the tabernacle, a tent, and, and thinks, you know, how can I live in this magnificent mansion, uh, this palace, and God, who is clearly more important and above me, uh, my own creator and uh, my sustainer, how, how can he live in this little tent which pales in comparison to my home? Uh, he doesn't want, uh, you know, God to dwell in a tent. Um, and of course, this is a, a mistake on David's part um, because children, is God homeless? Does God really need a home even for us to build him a home? No. The Bible says that God does not need us to build Him a temple or a house. He can, he can ask us to build Him one as a place that He will you know, meet us to bless us, 
Um, but he doesn't need anything from us. The Lord of heaven and earth does not dwell in temples made by human hands, as Paul says in Acts 17. And so God speaks to David through the prophet Nathan and turns his request upside down. He turns it on its head, and he basically says, look, if I wanted a house from you, David, I would have asked for one, uh, but, but I, I'm not asking for one because I don't need one. Remember who you are and who I am. David, I have been with you and I have been your God all this time. I'm the one who takes care of you. You don't take care of me, David. And in fact, I'm going to build you a house, David. You want to build me a house? No. But I will build you a house. And then we read in 2 Samuel 7, verse 12, when your David, God says to David, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And here's the key quote from Hebrews 1. I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. That's Hebrews 1 verse 5, what it's quoting. So God promises David that he will build him a house, but the kind of house he's going to build him is a dynasty. The house of David. Uh, right often a dynasty is referred to in this, this way. Uh, the, uh, the queen's house, the, 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 the monarch's house in, in England is known as the house of Windsor. Uh, well, God is going to build uh, David a house, a dynasty, meaning that he's going to have uh, his name, uh, one of his descendants of the house of, and lineage of David on his throne forever. And this coming king is going to build God a house. Only we come to the New Testament and find out that that house is the new covenant temple, the people of God. And, uh, but God says, of this son, of your of, of this king that's going to come forth from you, I will be to him a son. And uh, we go on then to read of this promise being temporarily fulfilled in Solomon, David's son, who in fact built the temple in Israel's history. And it seemed as if Solomon and the kingdom of Israel had finally arrived. Israel and Judah were as, as many as the sands of the sea, according to 1 Kings 4.20. Uh, which is a fulfillment of the promises made to Abraham. And they had a land. Again, in fulfillment of the promises made to Abraham. And uh, they had a king and an amazing temple. So what happened then? Well, King Solomon began to worship foreign gods due to his foreign wives. And the result of the history of Israel's kings is basically a sad story of idolatry. One king after another did not obey God and turn the hearts of the peoples to idols. And so even though God says, uh, I'm going to bring forth a son from you, David, who, and, I will, and he will be to me a son and I will be to him a father. A king's going to come forth from your loins and he's going to be the one who will sit on your throne forever. Uh, time and time throughout Israel's history we see that, that Solomon is not the king, nor any of the kings that followed after in Israel and Judah. Until finally, when the full, as Paul says in Galatians 4, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law. Finally, God sent forth His only begotten Son, the eternally begotten Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, to be this Davidic Son, this Messianic Son of God, this King who was promised to David. And when Jesus was baptized, do you remember what God said of Jesus at His baptism? He said, This is My beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Uh, and, and there you have it. The, the Davidic son has finally arrived. You know, sonship is, is one of the overarching themes of the Bible. In Luke's genealogy, 
Adam is called God's son at the end of that genealogy in Luke 4. Uh, in a couple places in the Old Testament, Israel is called God's firstborn son. And as we've seen, the king of Israel was uh, as a son to God the Father. But all of those sons were disobedient and did not please the Lord. They weren't careful to walk in His ways. And so at Jesus' baptism, it's as if God says, finally, here is My Son, the Son whom I love and the Son who loves and obeys Me as His Father. With this Son I am well pleased. You see, Jesus is the second and final Adam. He is true Israel and great David's greater son who redeems us and reveals what true sonship looks like. And, and Jesus' resurrection from the dead and ascension was His royal coronation as the Davidic King, the Messianic Son of God. If you look at Romans 1 verse 4, it says that Jesus was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by His resurrection from the dead. It was the vindication of Jesus as the Messiah, the Messianic King, when He was seated at the Father's right hand on the throne of David forever and ever. He fulfills 2 Samuel 7, that promise made to David. And so the whole Old Testament was pointing us to the fact that we need Jesus, the eternal Son of God, to come and fulfill the role of the Messianic King who would be the obedient Son of God. Great David's greater Son, the one who is well-pleasing to the Father. And so He is the unique Son of God according to His divine nature, being the eternally begotten Son of God, and according to His human nature. Uh, he is true God and true man. He is our mediator. He is the eternal divine Son of God and the messianic human Son of God. And it's because He has these qualifications that He's able to make us adopted sons of God through His precious blood. And so now we've meditated uh, on how Jesus is the unique Son of God. Let's transition now into how we become God's sons. Paul tells us, again in Galatians 4, when the fullness of time had come at just the right time in history, God sent forth His Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. What a wonderful passage of Scripture. Notice Paul says that we are all in Christ as a gift of grace received through faith alone in Christ alone, the eternally begotten Son of God. Through faith in His person and work, we are all called sons of God now in our adoption, and we are all heirs of eternal life through God. Now, as you read these words, especially in our modern egalitarian culture that wants to flatten all gender distinctions, going against God's created order, uh, but, but we're sensitive to this kind of language today now, aren't we? Um, and you may be wondering, when he says, you are all sons of God, he says it a couple times here. He calls us all sons, the, 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 both the men and the women in the church, the boys and the girls in the church are called sons of God. You may be wondering, well, what about the women? Wouldn't it be better to, if Paul would have said uh, that we receive adoption as children? 
rather than adoption as sons? Uh, wouldn't it have been better if he just said that you are all sons and daughters of God because of Jesus? Well, it's, it's true that we are all sons and daughters of God. We are all children of God. Um, but Paul here was making a cultural point when he wrote Galatians 4, and we ought not to tinker with the translation here. Uh, you see, in those days, in order to receive a portion of the Father's inheritance, you had to be a son. Uh, daughters didn't receive a portion of the inheritance. That's why they remained in their, their father's home and then they sought to be married to a, another man, sought to be married to a man one day. Um, they, they, they didn't you know, have jobs like we do today. They remained in their father's home and then they were married and then they were supported by their, their husband. Um, and, and only sons received an inheritance. And even more, it was the firstborn son who received a double portion of the inheritance. And so do you see what Paul is saying here of the women of the church? That in the kingdom of God that Christ inaugurated and will bring to fullness at His return, that men and women are both co-heirs. They're both called sons of God and therefore they both receive equally the inheritance even more the bible describes all the members of the church as firstborn sons do you see what it's saying here it's saying that we are co-heirs with christ of the inheritance of the kingdom of god and so that is why he says that you are all sons of god through faith in christ and this, this should never cease to amaze us that God calls us His beloved children, sons of God. I love the exclamation of John in 1 John 3, 1 when he says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. Uh, he says, what, see what kind of love. This is a, a, a love that, that we don't see anywhere in this world. An amazing, unconditional love. Undeserving like no other kind of love. Right? Because we were sons of Adam. We were by nature, as Ephesians 2 puts it, children of wrath, destined for destruction. And yet God so loved us that He gave us His only begotten Son to be the sacrifice for our sins and to purchase our adoption. It was a costly sacrifice. It was a costly price. Nothing was more uh, valuable than the blood of Jesus Christ. And yet, God so loved us, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And God demonstrates His own love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I don't know about you, but I can't imagine giving my, sacrificing my son or any of my children to adopt a child who hates me, who wants nothing to do with me, who would grow up to be my enemy, who, who's my enemy. And yet that is the love of our Father for us. He did not spare His only Son, but gave Him up freely for us all. And Jesus, the Son of God, freely went to the cross to save us from our sins. And that ought to amaze us. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And consider all the wonderful benefits that we receive as adopted sons of God. I love the Westminster Confession of Faith on this point when it talks about our adoption in chapter 12. You can find that in the back of your songbook, Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 12. 
Man, this is such a beautiful statement that you should meditate on over and over again um, to just reflect on the wonders of your adoption in Christ. It says this, it says, all those that are justified, God vouchsafeth, or graciously grants, all those that are justified, God graciously grants in and for His only Son, Jesus Christ, to make partakers of the grace of adoption by which they are taken into the number of His children, that is, and enjoy the liberties and privileges of the children of God. And what are those liberties and privileges of the children of God? What are the privileges that you have as a beloved child of God? Well, he, they list, it lists ten things here. Listen to these things. You have His name put upon you. What a wonderful thought, right? That God the Father places His name upon you in your adoption. He says, you are mine. And here is my name. I will place it upon you. And you can be called a child of God. And I'm not ashamed to call you my child. And it says that we also receive the spirit of adoption. And that's what Paul says, right? In Galatians 4, that he has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts by whom we can cry out, Abba, Father. The Holy Spirit takes up residence within us. And, 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 and He's the one who, who enables us to cry out, Abba, Father. And it goes on and says that, that we have, as a child of God, access to the throne of grace with boldness. There's a third privilege we have, right? It's similar to any other child and we, that we, child father relationship that we see in this world, right? You might imagine somebody who's of great importance, maybe the CEO of a company, where other people have a hard time getting access to that person. Uh, and especially, you know, other children in this world. But that CEO or, or that king or prime minister or whoever, their own children have special privileges. They have access to that father, that person as a father. So to you have access to the throne of grace with boldness. You don't need to be afraid to go into your father's presence in worship and in communion and prayer. Fourthly, it adds that we are enabled to cry, Abba, Father. The Bible says that the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And, and Paul says that we cry out, Abba, Father, through the Spirit of God. Fifthly, we are pitied. We are pitied by God the Father, right? Any f good father on earth pities their children when they are in distress, when they when they fall over and scuff their knees uh, or when they fall off their bike or when they're scared in the middle of the night because of a nightmare or whatever stress and anxiety they're going through, a father pities, has compassion upon his children. And even more, your heavenly father has compassion on you. They are protected. A good father protects their children. A good father and mother wants to make sure that their children are, are protected from harm when they cross the street, when they, when they go off, uh, when they get their driver's license and, and are going to start driving, they're, they're concerned about their protection, that they wear their seatbelt, that they learn how to drive properly. Um, when they go on a road trip, they pray for them. They're concerned about their, their protection from others. So to your Father protects you from all your enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil, ultimately. They are provided for a good father provides for his children. They are chastened by him as by a father. Right? The Bible says in Hebrews as well that, uh, that our heavenly father disciplines us in love as a father disciplines his children in love. Ninth, yet never cast off, but sealed to the day of redemption. We never need to fear that God is going to be fed up with us and kick us out of the family. We will be never cast off he loves us eternally, and He has sealed us to the day of redemption. And then tenth, and finally, the confession mentions that also we inherit the promises as heirs of everlasting salvation. We have an eternal inheritance awaiting us, and it is our guarantee in Christ. And the Spirit has been given to us as a guarantee. So these are all the wonderful things that we have as a privilege and a blessing and a, a gift of grace because we are adopted sons of of God, children of God in Christ, purchased 
with his precious blood. Meditate on them, uh, uh, you know, every day. Think about these things. William Perkins, the, the great Elizabethan, uh, one of the great uh, Puritans of, the, of Elizabeth Puritanism, Elizabethan Puritanism, uh, in 1558 to 1602, said that every believer should esteem his adoption as God's child to be greater than being the child or heir of any earthly prince, since the son of the greatest potentate may be the child of wrath, but the child of God by grace has Christ Jesus to be his eldest brother with whom he is fellow heir in heaven. He has the Holy Spirit also for his comforter and the kingdom of heaven for his everlasting inheritance. Your adoption as a child of God is greater than being a child of any other king in this world. Because it is the adoption of the king of the universe. God is your heavenly father. The Puritan Samuel Willard wrote, be always comforting of yourselves with the thoughts of your adoption. Draw your comforts at this tap. Fetch your consolations from this relation. Be therefore often chewing upon the precious privileges of it and make them your rejoicing. Let this joy outstrip the verdure of every other joy. Let this joy dispel the mists of every sorrow and clear up your souls in the midst of all troubles and difficulties as you await the heavenly glory where you will live out your perfect adoption by forever communing with the triune God. There you will dwell at the fountain and swim forever in those bankless and bottomless oceans of glory. Oh, beloved, meditate deeply on your adoption in Christ and all the wonderful privileges and blessings you have through Him. Well, not only do we see that we are how we become children of God, we've seen, we've seen how Jesus is uniquely the Son of God, and we've seen how we become God's sons. But third, and much more briefly, how Jesus is the greatest Lord. Uh, the author of Hebrews continues in Hebrews 1 to apply quotes from the Old Testament to Jesus that highlight His Lordship. It says in verse 8, of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. You will, they will all wear out like a garment, like a robe. You will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? What is the point we see here? Well, we see that Jesus, the Son of God, is Lord. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. And think about all the ways in which Jesus is Lord. He is Lord because he is the creator of all things according to hebrews 1 verse 2 and verse 10 here he's the creator of all things therefore he is lord and he is lord because he upholds all things he sustains us according to verse 3 and he is lord because god the father has exalted him over all as the davidic king according to hebrews 1 verse 5 and 8 and 13 and psalm 110 and other scripture passages. And then fourth, He is Lord because He is our Redeemer. According to verse 3 in Hebrews 1 here, he has, he has made purification for our sins. He has purchased us out of slavery and redeemed us with His precious blood. So He's Lord in all these ways. But our catechism really highlights this final reason that He has not with silver or gold, quoting from 1 Peter 1, right? Not with silver or gold, but with His precious blood, He has redeemed and purchased us body and soul from sin and from all the power of the devil to be His own. And I love how our catechism really highlights that as why He is called Lord. Right? It, could have, it could have gone to all these other reasons. Look, He is your Creator and He sustains you. He gives you every breath and every gift you have. Um, he's your creator and Lord. It could have also said he's the king of, of the universe. He's at the Father's right hand. He could have said all these things and said, now, now submit to him as Lord. Uh, 
And that would have all been true. And we acknowledge that freely. And we love that He is all those things for us. But it really melts our heart, right? When, it's, when He says that not with silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. He has purchased us out of slavery. Right? That's who we once were. We were slaves to sin and the devil and destined for eternal death. But Jesus Christ has purchased us out of slavery to sin and these other things with His precious blood. And so we, are, we rejoice to call Him our Lord. And, and this is why we love to call Him our Lord. Uh, you know, a lot of people in this world uh, hate authority by nature because of our sin nature. We hate authority. and We don't want anybody to be our master. We want to be the master of our own destiny. We want to serve nobody else but ourselves. But it's all a lie. We must serve someone. And, and we're either slaves to um, oppressive masters, to the oppression of sin and, and the tyranny of the devil, or we are slaves of the Lord Jesus Christ, and He is a good master. He's the best master. He's the greatest master. What other master lays down his life for his slaves and purchases them to be his servants? to be his, not only his servants, but also his brothers, and he's not ashamed to call us brothers, and to bring him in, bring them into the family as co-heirs. And so this is why we love our Lord. He is our God, and he is our elder brother, and he is our Lord who has purchased us with his own precious blood, redeemed us from slavery to sin and death and the devil, and brought us into the kingdom of God as God's beloved children. And so it is with great comfort and joy and thankfulness that we confess that we believe in Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, our Lord. And let us gladly serve Him in thankfulness all the days of our life and point others to where true freedom is found. As Jesus puts it in John 8, verse 36, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You for Your Word to us again. Thank You for redeeming us as Your own beloved children by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, Your only begotten Son, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He is the perfect sacrifice. He's the only sacrifice for all of our sins. We thank You, Jesus, for Your perfect life and for Your sacrificial death on the cross and Your resurrection from the dead and we thank you for reigning over all things for our sake at this time and for sustaining us as our great high priest our eternal king and our chief prophet and teacher and we we trust wholly in you and we we pray lord jesus quickly come and uh, we thank you holy spirit for bringing us to jesus and opening our hearts to trust in him and dwelling within us and being the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out Abba Father and assuring us that we are the children of God. We praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. And Father, we lift up to your various prayers of supplication through Jesus Christ, our mediator. Father, we lift up to you our marriages. We, we thank you for the gift of marriage. We pray that our, our married couples in our church would um, would grow in their love for each other, that they would be pulling up weeds of sin and um, division and selfishness and bitterness and other weeds in their marriage, and that they would be planting seeds of Christ-like love and patience and kindness and gentleness and self-control and forgiveness and humility and serving one another in love. We pray that you would also bless our marriages with purity in the marriage bed. And we pray that you would um, heal broken marriages in our midst and be with those who are in difficult marriages. We also pray that you'd strengthen engaged couples, that you'd strengthen uh, Josh and Janae and prepare them for marriage. Father, we also lift up to you our single people in our church. May they find contentment and joy in Christ during their singleness. If they desire to be married, help them to find a faithful Christian spouse. 
If they desire to remain single, may they find strength and joy in that calling as well. And may we be as a church a place where singles feel welcome and loved. And Father, we uh, lift up to you the elderly and widows and widowers in our congregation. Please, may they know your uh, tender, loving care and your powerful presence in their life and, their, and your love as a father. And uh, Father, we pray for parents and children that you would strengthen their bonds. We pray that parents would be faithful to raise their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and that uh, you would help parents to wisely guide their children in this world. And we pray for children that they would honor and obey their parents and grow up in every good direction in Christ. And that they would never know a time. They'd know Christ as, our, as their Lord and Savior. And Father, may they come to an early profession of faith. And, and may all wayward children who are wandering from the faith Bring them back by your Holy Spirit. Convict them of their sins and draw them back to Jesus Christ and His church. And Father, we pray for our expectant mother, Joanne Williams. We pray that, uh, that you would be with her and continue to strengthen her in her pregnancy and strengthen um, and knit the baby in her womb together. And may it be a full-term delivery and we thank you for the gift of children. Father, we pray for those who may be having a hard time um, bearing children of their own. Uh, please bless them with children if it be your will and grant peace and contentment with uh, you and your will either way. And Father, grant your loving presence and provision to orphans and those in foster care at this time. Uh, Father, you are the father of the fatherless. We pray that you would help us to have a, the same kind of concern and love for the orphans in society and that you would protect them and provide for them. We pray you'd also grant wisdom and strength and compassion to those who work at the Options Pregnancy Center. May they help counsel those with unplanned pregnancies to make choices in love for the good of the baby. And we pray that you would turn the hearts of the people of this country to turn away from the evils of abortion and to turn to you. Dear Father, we bring all these prayers to you with childlike reverence and trust, knowing that you are both able and willing to hear and answer our prayers, being Almighty God and our faithful Father, for the sake of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.